Good morning, everyone. Happy Palm Sunday. I, if I have not graced your acquaintance, my name is Sanjaya Prawiro. I am the director for our youth ministry here at GICF. If you are teens, uh, parents, and if I have not met you in person after the service, uh, please come see me. I'd like to get to know you um, better. Uh, associate parents and teens. Now this morning we will continue our sermon from the book of Matthew. We're nearing the end of the book of Matthew. Now the book of Matthew uh, has a special place uh, in my heart. It started about 30 years ago when I was a newborn again Christian. So I went to a Christian conference because I wanted to learn um, more how to share, how to read the Bible, how to dig through the Word. So I went to a Christian conference. Now, the speaker of that conference was a respected author and pastor. What was amazing about him is that he was able to memorize the whole Bible, word by word. Word by word. I don't know which version, but he did it. So at the end of the conference, he uh, challenged um, the attendees of the conference to start uh, their own, that means our own, personal memorization of the Bible, the whole Bible. Okay? And he suggested uh, that we should start from the book of Matthew. Okay? So uh, obviously, I was really excited being a newborn Christian and uh, I wanted to learn as much as I could. So I went home, uh, grabbed my Bible, op opened to Matthew chapter 1 and started reading verse 1 to start my personal memorizing the whole Bible journey. Now as soon as I read Matthew chapter 1 verse 1, it dashed my hope of memorizing the entire Bible. Do you know why? Anybody know what Matthew chapter 1 is about? Exactly. Jesus' genealogy, right? So, you know, my personal journey of memorizing the whole Bible failed. I made it to chapter 4, and then I made excuses, you know, study, etc., etc. But it actually uh, roused my curiosity. Why did Matthew start it with the genealogy of Christ? Who was he writing to? Um, why did he do it that way? And um, what was he trying, what message was he trying to convey? So it's evidence that the reason why Matthew started with um, the genealogy of Christ was because he wanted to prove to his audience, which was predominantly the Jewish people, that he wanted to absolutely establish Jesus' messianic identity and his inheritance of the Davidic kingship over Israel, and Jesus' fulfillment of the prophecies. So, today, as we started Palm Sunday, um, we are nearing the end of our series on the book of Matthew, and we'll be focusing on Matthew chapter 27, verses 57 to 66 today. Now, most of your Bible will have it titled, Jesus is Buried, or guards at the tomb. In fact, most of us, every year when we hear this message or when we read this passage, we glaze over it. Right? We, we just skip or just read quickly. Most people during this time will focus on the story of Jesus dying on the cross, the crucifixion, and his resurrection. But between this dying on the cross and his resurrection lies a beautiful story that shows God in his sovereignty towards his redemptive plan in the life of his son, Jesus Christ. Now, this passage about Jesus' burial is also important because it appears four times in the Synoptic Gospel. Now, when you see that a passage is repeated, it's, 
important. Now, if you repeat it four times, that means God has a special message. Why it has to be repeated four times with different people? So Jesus' crucifixion, his, his burial, and his resurrection are part of the pillars in which the Christian foundation is built upon. If anyone can disprove that there was no crucifixion, that Jesus did not die on the cross, he was not buried, he was somebody else's, or he did not rise from the dead, then basically the Christian faith will crumble. So I want, uh, as we move forward, um, as we move forward, we should see um, that, keep this phrase in the back of your mind, that God's sovereignty and His providence in Jesus' burial. That means, I want to share from God's perspective on the significance of Jesus' burial. In other words, we will see how God in His sovereignty, long before Jesus was born, is working to bring about His redemptive plan. Now, throughout the Gospel of Matthew, this theme, right, as we keep that in this, this phrase in the back of our mind as we move on today, how God's sovereignty and His providence repeatedly play out in the life of Jesus Christ. In fact, the event of Jesus' burial was foretold long before it happened. This emphasizes the idea that nothing happens by chance or out of God's control. Even the actions of those who oppose Him, God brought it for His purpose and for His plan. So before we unpack um, the passage this morning, let's uh, bow our heads in, in prayer. Father, as we come before you this morning um, to celebrate um, Easter, uh, we pray, Lord, that the Holy Spirit will be um, here this morning to stir the heart of the congregation, that they see the beautiful story and how you work, um, King, your plan in the life of Jesus to redeem us from our sins. Amen. So if you have your Bible, please turn to uh, Matthew chapter 27. Uh, we will read verses 57 to 61. Um, now when evening had come, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who himself had also become a disciple of Jesus. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be given to him. When Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his new tomb, which he had hewn out of the rock. And he rolled a large stone against the door of the tomb and departed. And Mary Magdalene was there, and the other Mary sitting opposite the tomb. On the next day, which followed the day of preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees gathered together to Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember while he was still alive, how that deceiver said, After three days I will rise. Therefore command that the tomb be made secure until the third day, lest his disciple come by night and steal him away, and say to the people, He has risen from the dead, so the last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard, go your way, make it as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb as secure. Uh, and sealing the stone, setting the guard. It's really quiet in here. We were supposed to read them together. God bless you. God knows that you need your rest this morning. So uh, welcome to church. <laughs> um, <clears throat> as we read this passage, um, it naturally um, lends into, it, it breaks its, itself into three distinct uh, points. The first one, we're going to talk about the fulfillment of the prophecy in Jesus' burial. And then we'll discuss about the story of Jesus being buried. What is the significance in that? And then finally, we'll end with the applications. 
So, most people, uh, when we talk about the fulfillment of the prophecy of the Messiah, which passage in the Bible describes the best of Christ's fulfillment, which is often most quoted? Anybody? None? What? Uh, it's from the book of Isaiah. It's Isaiah chapter 53. It's the most often quoted passage in the Bible. Now, uh, okay. So, we see, before we dive into Isaiah 53, our first point for today is remember this phrase, God's sovereignty and providence in Jesus' burial. So, in the prophecy, God is laying the groundwork for his redemptive plan. So in summary, these are most often quoted for the fulfillment of the prophecy in the life of Jesus. He was despised and rejected by men. He has borne our grief and carried our sorrows. He was crushed for our iniquities. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. There was no deceit in his mouth. So, as we read Isaiah 53, these are most often quoted on Jesus uh, fulfilling the prophecies. None of these quote unquote common verses mention anything about Jesus' burial. Right? So, how does that ref reflect to the actual Jesus' burial? Where was it? If you look closely to verse 9, it says, And they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. So we see the word grave. So the grave was prepared. Now, a grave is usually prepared to bury someone, right? In this case, uh, Jesus will be buried in that grave. And the second one is the word rich. Okay? Uh, there are different uh, translations and different meanings to this, but the one that uh, I like for this particular passage is the fact that Jesus will be buried in an expensive tomb. So the fact that uh, the act of Jesus' burial it fulfilled the prophecy even in Isaiah 53. Before we move on to um, the Matthew verses, I want to share who are the people that are mentioned in this passage so that we are all in the same page. First one is Pontius Pilate. He's the Roman prefect, uh, governor of Judea. He allowed Jesus to be crucified. Uh, we have a guy by the name of Joseph of Arimathea. He came from the city of Ramathaim Zophim. He was a rich man. He was a disciple of Jesus. In another passage, he was described as a secret disciple of Jesus. And he was part of the Sanhedrin, a member of the Supreme Court religious ruler of ancient Israel. Now, this is important for us to remember. We have the chief priests, the high-ranking members of the priesthood. They are also in the Sanhedrin. We have the Pharisee, they belong to a religious sect. There's another Sadducees, but the Pharisees are mentioned here. We have Mary Magdalene, I know it's kind of small. Um, Jesus healed her from demon possessed. Her name was mentioned 12 times in the Bible. She was present at both the crucifixion and the tomb. And then finally, we see the other Mary. Mary, the mother of James, the younger. Joseph and Salome. This is not Mary, the mother of Jesus. And she was also present at the crucifixion and the tomb. So my point number two, in God's sovereignty and his providence, God lay, is laying the groundwork for the event and doctrine of the resurrection. So what is he saying? He's basically trying to laying the foundation for us 
to understand the resurrection. And he is also setting the testimony for those people that are involved for the re resurrection. The testimony not only from his disciples, not only from his closest followers, but also from his enemies. Okay? Now we are going to go verse by verse. Uh, hopefully you stay with me uh, in this, right? And I try to make it as exciting as we uh, go verse by verse. So this is kind of small because I don't want to waste a lot of slides. Verse 57. Now when evening had come, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who himself had also become a disciple of Jesus. What is the, why, what, what did Matthew write from left to right? What was the first word that we see that is interesting here? The first word that is interesting here in this verse is the word evening. Now in the Jewish culture and tradition, uh, if you are on, I mean, if you die on a Friday, you need to be buried before sundown, before evening comes. Because on the Sabbath day, you're not supposed to be working, right? So Matthew specifically mentioned that, you know, Jesus died before sundown. And there's this guy, Joseph, came and, you know, he was buried properly according to the Jewish uh, tradition. The next word that we see from this verse is the word rich. Now, there is not too many of Jesus' disciples that is rich. Most of them are fishermen and ordinary people. The only person that I think is rich could be Matthew. He was a tax collector, but then he gave away uh, his wealth anyway. And then we see uh, Joseph mentioned from a place called Arimathea, about 20 miles northwest of Jerusalem. Uh, that will play an important uh, point later on in the story. And finally, we see Joseph is also a disciple of Jesus. Now, if you follow the theme of God's sovereignty and His providence, to me, the most interesting part of this verse in that overall theme is who is Joseph of Arimathea? In the book of Matthew from chapter 1, verse 1, to Matthew chapter 27, verse 56, we have never heard of this disciple. Zero. And then suddenly he appeared out of nowhere that... Um, on the scene. Jesus' disciple was not there. Now remember, in previous chapters, remember when John the Baptist was beheaded, it was John Baptist's disciple who went to see Herod to ask for John's body to be buried. Right? Where was Jesus' disciple in this case? But instead of, instead of Jesus' disciple, we see Joseph, a man that appeared out of nowhere. And a man will dis this man will disappear as quickly as he appeared. He played a part only in four verses in the book of Matthew. Four. Four. So, again, the overlaying theme of Jesus, uh, of God's sovereignty and his providence. In this case, God is laying the groundwork for the event and doctrine of the resurrection. Next verse, this man went to Pilate and asked for, her body, for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be given to him. Anything strikes you as something that stands out on this verse? Imagine you or me in the evening, we knock on the governor's house and said, I want to see the governor without previous appointment. Do you think the governor would see you? Most likely not, right? In this story, Joseph was able to see Pilate without a previous appointment. Now, remember it was evening time. 
right? Jesus had to be buried before sundown. So when Joseph met with Pilate, there was no time for chit-chat. Hey, Pilate, how is uh, your wife? How is your kids? Uh, is Caesar conquering more territory? Or uh, is our taxes going to be increased? There was no chit-chat. Joseph basically went to Pilate and said, I need the body of Jesus. I want to bury him. Right? Now, in Mark chapter 15, we were told that Pilate was actually surprised that Jesus had died. Because a crucified person will take hours or if not days for them to die. Right? And the Romans usually would leave the body hanging until the body deteriorate and they just shove it and throw it into the common mass grave. If that had happened, the scripture would not have been fulfilled because it would be extremely difficult for anyone to identify Jesus' body at that deteriorated state. So Pilate had to ask a centurion to verify that Jesus had indeed died. And the centurion who was overseeing Jesus' crucified, crucifixion verified that Jesus had indeed died. He had one of the soldiers pierce Jesus' side and blood and water came and it, it, medically it signifies that someone had already died. So the story of why God specifically had chosen Joseph of Arimathea begin to be unveiled. God knew that only Joseph of Arimathea could have pulled this off. Not only was Joseph an extremely rich person, but he was a very influential person, not only in the Jewish community, but probably in the Roman territory of Judea. The pilot listened to him, right? So, again, the overall arching theme of God's sovereignty and His providence. God, in this verse, is laying the groundwork for the event and doctrine of the resurrection. Next verse. When Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth. Now, in John chapter 19, we were also told that Nicodemus was there. Uh, he brought um, 75 pounds of myrrh and aloes, and with both of them, they, they wrapped Jesus' body for his burial. Now, this linen clothing that Joseph gave to Jesus was probably the nicest outfit he had worn while he was uh, on earth. So we see Joseph taking care, great care of the body of the Lord. This simplifies to the fact that God right, foretold Jesus' burial and, his, and in his providence, which means his care, is not overlooking even the tiniest bit. Now we come to verse 60. Uh, this is going to be uh, uh, a bit longer um, to describe the story, but it will be fun. And laid it in his new tomb, which he had hewn out of the rock. And he rolled a large stone against the door of the tomb and departed. Matthew explicitly reminds us here that this is Joseph's own family tomb. And this is a new tomb. Now, remember also that Joseph was part of the Sanhedrin. So he was there when the verdict was cast that Jesus would be crucified a few days before. Right? So he probably went home and talked to his wife and tell her that, by the way, I'm going to uh, ask Pilate to take the body of Jesus and bury it in our new tomb. So, stay with me here. There are probably two scenarios that Joseph's wife is going to comment on Joseph's statement. 
The first one, Joseph, you have been working hard all your life to be a member of the Sanhedrin, and now you are going to throw that away in one day. Why would you go against mainstream? Now, this is a familiar face that we hear today in our society against mainstream. And his wife could also have said, they would crucify you too. Because the other members of the Sanhedrin were conspiring right, to crucify Jesus. So if you are associated with the guy that, was, that will be crucified or already crucified, then you know, your chances of being uh, sentenced to die is also great. Maybe the wife also said, what about the wife's club? What are they going to say to me behind my back? What about our kids who are in religious school? Will they be canceled? Another familiar face that we hear in our society today. Or another scenario, Joseph's wife could have said, I support you, Joseph. I also believe that Jesus is the Son of God and He is the Messiah that is to come. Regardless of which scenario that we think happened in his household, when Joseph told his wife about his plan of burying Jesus in their tomb, Joseph did what was burdened. He was burdened to do out of his faith for the Lord. He knew what could have cost him, but he did it. He did it boldly and courageously. You know what Joseph did here? turned out to be absolutely crucial in fulfilling the two prophecies in the book of Isaiah. He provided the tomb, and it was an expensive tomb. And we'll see later why it is an expensive tomb. So Joseph, who thought that he was just doing something meaningless, an act of just burying the body of Jesus was in fact not only fulfilling scriptures, but he was instrumental in the grandeur plan of God in the preparation for the glory of Jesus in his resurrection. Now, if you look at your Bible, verse 60 ended with Joseph rolling a large stone against the door to the tomb, and then he departed. That is the end of the story of Joseph of Arimathea. We saw him came in the evening. We saw him talk to Pilate. Saw him prepare um, Jesus' body for the burial. Closed with the large stone to the tomb. And we say bye-bye to Joseph. Interesting, right? Out of nowhere, he came. And then as quickly as he appeared, he was gone. But... Jesus' body is in the tomb, and he was buried. That is the end of the story in verse 60. But Matthew did not end his story there. He also added, and Mary Magdalene was there, and the other Mary sitting opposite the tomb. So who were the people that witnessed everything from start to finish? It was Joseph, Nicodemus from another book in the Synoptic Gospel, and then the two Marys. So think about how important this is. In those days, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, even though they had theological differences, but they were united against Jesus' teaching. So imagine Matthew writing a story that a Pharisee buried Jesus. If it is not a true story, he would have been laughed at. His scroll will not make it a week on the front page. Everybody would know that this is a hoax, unless it is true. Why wasn't Peter there? Why wasn't John there? But we had the two Marys. 
So even when Jesus' closest friend and his disciple had abandoned him, God, before the foundation of this world, had ordained that Jesus' body would be taken care of by a disciple whom we have never heard before and witnessed by two women. Now, Paul confirmed this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scripture. So Paul is writing the fact that it is explicit fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecy. Jesus was crucified, he died, he was buried, and he rose again from the dead, according to the scripture. The end. That's it. So, the two points thus far, in terms of God's sovereignty and his providence in this story, the first one is his redemptive plan. God is laying the work for his redemptive plan through the prophecies and the fulfillment of the prophecies through Jesus. And then, in the first part of Jesus' burial, God is laying the groundwork for the event and doctrine of the resurrection. Now, in verses 62 to 66, God is setting up a scenario whereby he's basically going to vindicate his son. God is defending his son's truthfulness and showing or exposing his persecutor's deceitfulness. Basically, God is saying, you know, you, you, you accuse my sons of all of this, blah, 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 and now it is my turn. I'm going to vindicate him. So in verses 62 to 66, God is setting, is laying the groundwork for this. Verse 62, on the next day, which followed the day of preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees gathered together to Pilate. Jesus died on a Friday, and this is now a Saturday, which is a Jewish Sabbath. Okay? Now, remember when Jesus was alive, he was telling the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, that they were making up laws by themselves with regard to the law of the Sabbath. Now, one particular law of the Sabbath is that when you step out of your home and you walk a number of steps beyond the allowable steps, you are considered working. So you can see here, the Pharisee made up their own law of the Sabbath, but they purposefully break it because they had to walk a distance just to go to see Pilate. So instead of honoring God of the Sabbath, they were scheming against God, they were trying to play God. The other thing that we see here that is missing is where was Joseph of Arimathea? If he was part of the Sanhedrin, wouldn't he be part of this group that went to see Pilate? Why do you think this chief priest and the Pharisees did not bring Joseph with them? Because probably Joseph had more pull with Pilate than the others combined. You know, if Pilate was, uh, if Joseph of Arimathea was there, whatever they were trying to scheme will probably will not work. Because Joseph had influence, more influence to Pilate than the rest of the group, right? Verse 63, saying, Sir, we remember while he was still alive, how the deceiver said, after three days, I will rise. Uh, if we read the previous chapters in Matthew, what was stood out about this verse? The Pharisee said, after three days, 
that I will rise. Remember in Jesus' trials, what were the Pharisees and the high priests accused Jesus of? They were accusing Jesus of what? Anybody? Attacking the temple, tearing the temple, and build it in three days, right? Creating chaos, which is not good for the Romans' territory, right? Which is why Pilate agreed uh, in the end to finally uh, release Barabbas because he wanted to keep peace. But here, we see that the high priests and the Pharisees, actually they were confessing to Pilate that they were lying in Jesus' trials. Because the true reason that they actually persecuted Jesus was that he was going to rise again on, on the third day. Right? So again, God is setting up a scenario whereby he is going to vindicate his son uh, through his sovereignty and providence. Verse 64. Therefore, command that the tomb be made secure until the third day, lest his disciple come by night and steal him away and say to the people, he has risen from the dead, so the last deception will be worse than the first. So paraphrasing, basically, the Pharisees is telling Pilate, look, if the disciples steal the body and they spread the hoax that Jesus had risen from the dead, then it would be much more chaotic than what he actually did. You know, like tearing the temple or attacking, breaking down the walls of the temples. It's much worse. Uh, verse 65, Pilate said to them, you have a guard, go your way, and make it as secure um, as possible. Um, remember why they did not take uh, Joseph of Arimathea to see Pilate? At this point, even though Pilate had agreed for them to have a guard and secure the tomb, what, what do you think is going on in Pilate's head? I think he was extremely scared. Because the day before, Joseph, an influential person, right, did not even mention one iota of the fact that there is a slight possibility that Jesus could have been raised from the dead. If... Joseph mentioned to Pilate that, oh, by the way, uh, he, there's a slight chance that, you know, this guy might raise from the dead in three days. Do you think Pilate would give the body to Joseph? Most likely not. We see also that the disciples were not there. So the Pharisees and the high priests, they were accusing Jesus' disciple of potentially stealing the body, right? So think about this. They were nowhere to be seen, okay? Not, not in the crucifixion, not in the tomb. So the one that were present at the tomb was Joseph of Arimathea, Nicodemus, and the two Marys. None of the disciples knew where Jesus was buried. Next week, in part of the resurrection passage, the two women, the two Marys, they actually had to show the disciple where Jesus was buried. So the idea of the disciples stealing Jesus' body was never in question. Matthew was telling us that. It, was, it never crossed their mind because they did not know where Jesus was buried. Another thing we can read from we can infer from the passage was that the mental state of the disciples at this time was that they were so demoralized, they were sad, they were angry, they were confused. What is God doing? I didn't understand. And they were afraid 
to be near Jesus because they were afraid to be associated with him, potentially be caught and also crucified, right? So the last thing is on their mind is to steal the body of Jesus. So first, that the Pharisees were accusing them of uh, stealing the body. The first reason that it did not make sense, the disciples didn't know where Jesus was buried. And number two, the mental state of the disciples, stealing Jesus' body, never, never crossed their mind. Right? But Pilate, to save his own skin, you know, I better guard the tomb, I better send some guard, just in case Jesus indeed rise from the dead. And he want to keep peace in the territory. The final verse we see here is that so they went and made the tomb secure, sealing the stone and setting the guard. So if you are the high priest and the Pharisees, and you are afraid that a fake resurrection would happen, what would you do? What would be the next logical step that you do to prevent a fake resurrection? You make sure that there's a body in the tomb. So what probably happened is the soldiers uh, in the order of the Pharisees, they rolled back the stone, they went inside the tomb, they checked, but because it was covered, they probably peek, you know, well, yep, there's that scar from the spear. Right? This is definitely Jesus. Right? Otherwise, if, if, if they don't verify that there was indeed a body of the right person in the tomb, then, you know, hoax could spread. So the most logical step that they had to do was to actually verify that there was indeed a body and that body belongs to Jesus. And what do they do next? They roll back the stone and putting the seal. So God is laying the groundwork to vindicate his son. You said there was going to be a fake resur resurrection, but you yourself verified that the body was there. You verified that he's dead, and you yourself sealed it. And this, is come, this comes from the testimony of his enemies, not a friendly party. So, if we look at the summary taken together, these events demonstrated that God was at work even before Jesus' ministry began on earth. And also, God is at work even in Jesus' darkest hour of his ministry on earth. And God's plan was unfolding exactly as he had intended. Now, this can be a source of comfort and encouragement for us believers who can trust that God is at work today even when things seem uncertain or out of control. Now, how often is the case where there are things happening around the world that is against Christians or against the Christian faith, that God take it, turn it, and use it for His purposes and for His glory. This is a beautiful story in His overruling sovereignty and providence. God ordered things so that the death and burial of Jesus were placed beyond all doubt. The first two applications on this story kind of go hand in hand. Be bold, be courageous. All of us in life are called to exercise that kind of faith and devotion to the Lord. Sometimes in a very small and mundane things, and sometimes it's in a big way that require great sacrifices from us. Nonetheless, 
we see Joseph being bold and courageous. He boldly and courageously went to Pilate. He knew the dangers. He knew what could have cost him. But he did it anyway. Final point for today is for us to trust God. My friends, um, you may be in such a point in time in your own life where you are tempted to doubt God's sovereignty and His providence. You may be facing something that uh, you just don't understand how God is going to be able to work it out. But we see from Matthew's writing here is that, you know, we were so demoralized. We didn't understand what was going on. But at the end of the day, we were able to see how God is working even though they were, their head was somewhere else. That God continue his work even though his closest friend and his disciple abandoned him. God moves in a mysterious ways. He has a plan. It is a loving plan and it is a good plan. His providence, which means his care, for us is beyond measure. We just have to let go and trust him. Now, perhaps um, you are here uh, and this is the first time that you are hearing this message and you have a lot of questions that you want to ask. Or perhaps you are here um, and you are wavering in your faith. Or perhaps this morning you are here because you want to return back um, to the Lord. There is no better time to return than today. God is not done uh, in your life. God is not done in your life, in your life, and my life. And he's certainly not done with the people that is around us. In his sovereignty and his providence, it's a beautiful story for his redemptive plan. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for um, your faithfulness and that your word lasts through eternity. We have sometimes doubt, Lord, of your sovereignty. We try to do it ourselves with our own strength. Sometimes we just have to let go and trust you. Now, if you are here and you are tired of uh, fighting and uh, with this life and you are confused and you just want to repent from your sin and you want to surrender your life to Christ, uh, please follow me in this prayer. Father, uh, you know who I am and, and what am I, what I am. I am a sinful person. Lord, I want to repent from my sin. I want to give my burdens to you. I want you to be the Lord of my life. I want to surrender uh, my life to you. You are the Lord of my life starting from today. Now, if you said that prayer this morning, uh, please come see me or one of the elders at the church. Uh, we want to make sure that you are discipled, you are taken care of. We thank you, Lord, for your message this morning. Thank you for your sovereignty that we can trust you and trust with your plan. In Jesus' name we pray. Have a great week of worship, everyone.